And then that self same Dennis of the Titans became king of the world. During this time when all those raids took place, they ended up claiming itself a kingdom. Again, I don't know how they got around the Imperium, but they did. And I think Dennis was the sixth or seventh king, I'm not really sure. But always in the back of his mind was the Army of the West. He knew them, and they had no one to fight. So he started talking to his barons about getting together some troops and training like they were supposed to fight as a unit. And his barons, most of them said, well, there's seven fighters in my barony. What do we do? Three against four? That was what happened for a long time. It was surprising because Aitenveld stretched from the mountains outside of Kaid to the Atlantic Ocean. All of that territory was one kingdom. And most of the people in that kingdom had never seen each other. At the time there was a saying throughout most of the kingdom other than Aitenveld proper. All things come to those who journey to the capital. That was true. Although the journey to the capital for some was two or three days straight drive. Flogged the horses. Didn't matter. You'd get there into it. Dennis's reign came and went. came to pass that during his reign there were many ambassadors going back and forth between his court and the western court and the Kaidian court trying to stir something up. And then his grace Deaton Clayman was successor to death. He appointed Dennis Earl Marshall. So Dennis continued to send agents provocateurs back and forth between the courts to try to get something started that was a little more formal. And it went on through Jonathan's reign, Deaton's reign, to Sir Tom Traveller's reign, and up to my reign, which was in. 1977. After our coronation, which was here in Alberta, we lived in the steps, which was in Dallas. We had a double wedding with Chris Heinrich Diego. first job was to go to Georgia, Meridius, and crown John Bear Killer, the first king. On the way back, we had reason to get in touch with our Earl Marshal in uh, Aitendale, who was that self-same Dennis of the Titans. There's a small garrison in a pass called Burrow Creek. We'll meet them there. 
I said, great, get everything done. We'll talk to you when we get back. We ended up in a belt property. We sent out the notices of war. And we waited for February. Tried to figure out what we were going to do. Tried to figure out how many people we were going to have in an army. Tried to figure out how we were going to pay for it. Tried to figure out a lot of things. It took many, many bottles and many, many long, cold nights. But we figured out what the heck. We'd show up, see what happened. The highway, the King's Highway in Borough Creek was small, rugged, through a Joshua forest. We kept driving and driving. The horses would keep pulling and pulling. We'd go up and we'd go down. Go around. Most of the time we kept going up. Then there was a sign. Burrow Creek Garrison. Naturally the sign was cracked. But it still had an arrow pointing reasonably right. And we went down a smaller road. We came out of a small pass into glory, a beautiful canyon, a bridge, some 200 feet long and 70 feet above the river, which they call the creek. At times it was a river. The local inhabitants were camped on the side of a hill, hundreds of them, just sitting there. They made their huts out of light pieces of metal they called aluminum, big square boxes of them all over this hillside. My lady and I were the first to arrive. As befits a king, look out the battlefield first, see what you can see. We were there probably a quarter of an hour before a third of the army showed up. Girl Creek was set in benches that led down to the river. We camped on those benches, leaving the last bench open for important things like the taverns, the inns, more taverns, and an area to hold court. This was Friday morning. Friday evening, from the top of the bridge looking down into the valley, all you could see were fires and pavilions. For as far as you could look from one end of the valley to the other end of the valley, and further out to where the firelight was bouncing off the cliffs all around. Never but I've seen so many SCA people just fire. Never had I seen so many belts, so many knights, so many words, so many pelicans. I remember walking down into the campground. And I found there the Prince of the Sun, the 
Prince of the Outlaws. Prince of Anseor. And their ladies. With one exception. The Princess of Anseor was in the labor with an heir. So she couldn't make it. But the entire royal family of Aitenville was at this event. At the time, it was the largest event ever to be held in Aitenville's history. There were 450 people there. The next morning, we broke the ice on the water. It was 28 degrees. We could hear the Western Army complaining that it was supposed to be hot in the desert. The well folded again. We gathered the army as they gathered theirs. And they took the field with 75 fighters. We asked them to naturally march down to it. And when they did, they marched through our army. We were manning the side of the road, allowing them the joy of seeing all of us ready to beat them. Small people. It was discouraging for them because we burst into song. The entire army, led by one of the finest bards I've ever heard, Baldwin Mackens, great bard, showed what a bard can do to an army if he's good. He doubled the strength of our army and cut their army in half just with his words and his music. It's a wonderful thing to hold. Then, just to make them sit in the cold a little longer, we had court. Gave away a bunch of words, got down on the field. And I called for it night. And for the very first time ever, anywhere in the SCA, we met the man on the field. It had always been done in court. It had never been done in army. It had never been done on the field. Sir Nikolai. Then we started fighting. All day long. We'd get together and try to determine what we were going to do. Because nobody had planned anything. We weren't starting with you. You'd think that we would have to plan anything. We figured it would just show up. But it did. I took command of the Valiant Army, marched them forward. I promptly got them all slaughtered. You mean the charge down off the hill? Not yet. That was a little oh, later. Okay. Uh, first, I had to figure out that step, step, step was not good. But we were learning. They had had three years of maneuvers. This is the first time most of our army had seen one another at one place at one time. They actually knew what to do. They had units. We had units. And our units knew what they were doing. It's just that nobody knew what each other was doing. We had Alboron on our extreme left flank. Monsignor was in the middle. 
the principality of the sun was on the right side and in reserve. You were on a slight rise because everybody always says take the high ground. Right? That sounds good. No, you don't want the high ground. When you're on the high ground, unless you ground your shield and kneel, the nether regions of your body stick out. And they hit them. And you can't reach their heads. Bad idea. So, we came. There was a gentleman there named Sir Charles of the Jazz. And he's still playing by it. He made the very first seated plate ever to be seen in this society. He promptly got about 15 feet behind the entire army, started running, started screaming to make way, and leaped off of the hill onto the army of the West sideways, knocking down approximately 12 people. This so stunned the Osteoran fighters that they didn't move until they heard him down there being pummeled, screaming, follow me, you idiots. And then everybody came off with him, including Alberon. Unfortunately, Alberon and Sir Torrance and myself the only ones who made it all the way through their army. And then we died. It was a lot of fun. At that point, we sent some of our knights out, grabbed the Sadu Din, brought him before us, and knighted him. So yeah, Assad was knighted when the world was young, but not that way. The rest of the time we spent chasing each other's women, <laughs> drinking each other's liquor. That wasn't me. No, of course not. <laughs> he didn't bathing in the liquor. <laughs> taking pictures, and getting into all types of mischief. It was wonderful. Friendships were made that are still in existence now, 30 years later. Plans were made for the next war that was going to take place. <coughs> addresses and phone numbers were exchanged from the officer types so that we could do it correctly, actually make it an SCA function. This was an SCA function, it was just a little late. Notification got into the newsletters about a month after it happened. Not in ours, in theirs. We were always able to get things in ours rather quickly. And then it was Monday and the sun went down and everybody was gone. And as we left, we looked at the field and it was cleaner than we had found it. And the natives were going back into the hills, just so you know. The natives were a group of people called the Good Sands. They were an RV club. And they found Earl Creek before we did. But they so enjoyed our company that they came every year. They stayed off of the area we liked to camp in. Up on, they stayed on the side of the hill and they watched. They were uh, very friendly people. Except for dogs. They kept couple of years when it was a little wet, they had some firewood under tarps for us so that when we got there we could have a fire that was dry. Very nice people. We went home. 
in October of the same year, there was a war in Redlands in California. And most of the people who went came from Principality of the Sun. There were a few outlanders, and there were three on steroids. Once again, who got trounced. The next war that came about was Burrow Creek II. The setting was the same, and it was just as lovely as it had been before. But more people came. We had a hundred on Abram outside. They had a hundred and twenty. We had devised scenarios. We had a defile fight. 56 acres to play on, and we had a defile fight. And then we had an open field fight, which was fun. We ran back and forth. We got to know each other even more. We started making plans ahead of time for number three. There was correspondence between royalty and between officers concerning armor standards, weapon standards. We even brought archery into it. We even brought a trebuchet into it for number three. Number three comes about Earl Creek Three. Everybody's there. The fighters have increased 20 to 25 percent per side. So we're we're getting close to 300 armored men on the field, boy, and close to 600 people. It's getting to be a little tough to find a place to camp that was not cheap and jowl next to your neighbor. But it was fun. There was still room for the tavern. Still room for the inn. Still room to walk in and drinking. We found out a couple of things that week. One, you should not use bags of flour as ammunition for cattle. That was bad. They weighed too much. And when they hit, they would burst open and people would choke. So bags of flour were. I mean, couldn't use them. <laughs> then we tried flour bags with no flour in them, but with closed cell phone in them and rock. The rock was in the middle, it had the foam all around it, it should have worked. Whoever was doing it didn't quite fill it with enough foam. And when it hit, a heavier object in flight, and then the softer object hits something immovable, the heavier object will continue in flight until it hits something immovable. Consequently, the rocks were knocking people down. <laughs> That didn't work either. <laughs> well, we gave the trebuchet guys one more chance. We tried it with water. It was hot, so we figured it's going to break, water will get everywhere, it'll be great, and everybody who's wet is dead. Well, probably it would have worked if we had balloons. But we didn't have balloons. <coughs> we had those big cube things, about a heavy plastic. <laughs> we don't take them all up, so the spouts and stuff that came off of it were covered. 
Well, they didn't break. <laughs> they just knocked people down. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> so we banned trebuchets until we could find suitable ammunition. We were crazy when we were young. I'm sorry? <laughs> we were crazy when we were young. Oh, yeah. We were invincible. Big time. We were heroes. <laughs> Nothing could hurt us. That was the same year that we had archery. And we were in the open field battle down amongst the mesquite and the rocks and the bushes. That's when you got your wheel, yeah. 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 And I was. Uh, and the little I was down in the bottom where. Master Baldrick. Barbarian. Balder Bane. Yeah. Had his cannon. <laughs> set on a rock facing a path. Pretty quick place for a cannon. I just happened to see it. You know, so. What's in the cannon? And he started to turn around, and here comes a Western patrol running down the back. So he torched it and said, Confetti! And it went boom! Unfortunately, <laughs> confetti was propelled by gunpowder, and when confetti and gunpowder were mixed, <laughs> confetti burns. <laughs> and I have never seen more knights and squires and men at arms divest themselves of their armor. Quick <laughs> pieces were flying in many directions. Tabards were smoldering. So was beards and hair. It was great. Walbert ran. <laughs> Leaving his cannon. <laughs> but taking the gunpowder. <laughs> well, we got those guys calmed down, thanks to the ladies who were bearing water at the time. So, cannons are out there. We're hearing another push from the left, their left, their right flank into our left flank. They were perceived by a hail of arrows. And another hail of arrows. And then... Uh, and these are wooden shafted <coughs> arrows with falling tips on the top. Supposedly the metal tips cut off underneath. And everything to make it legal was wrapped in tape so they wouldn't quite shatter. Right. All the fighters had to wear gratings over their faces, right. screens, because the arrows were just a little too small so they'd fit in. Um, so I heard Al <laughs> looked in that direction and saw Lord Ian McDuff. Is at the time. At the time. <laughs> Ian McDuff now. Standing there with his arm like this, and there was an arrow through. It. And he was dripping. <laughs> Chorus! Oh, that's bad. <laughs> oh. So we stopped. Went over to the other side, got a king over and said, he said, okay, you agree? I said, I agree. Find our king. We went and found the king and banned Archer. Found enough of the board members there to ban archery society-wide until we found something that would work there. And pulled the arrow out of it. Here, hold this. Got him to it. Was it you? I took him to him because I didn't know what he was doing. He was here, wasn't he? No, it was this arm. Right here. But it, was up it was this yeah. arm. Yeah, it was the upper. It was kind of sticking out. Yeah. I always thought it was the shoulder from the leg. The okay. shaft had broken, the tip had come off. I, I, I know the story. I, I'm not going to argue with how it hurt. It was. I just always heard it different. It's the same here except with my dog on Somebody that. gleaned a broken arm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Then we had number four. Still in Burl River. Only that year it was Burl River. The Shiki into the river with a banner. Oh, yeah. Instead of the creek, which was usually down here, one of the benches we fought on was here, and there was another bench. 
it was Burrow River, and the water extended from the cliffside all the way up. The bench that we fought on was under seven foot of water. Who was king that year? You had to ask. Does it say in your book? I'm just trying to figure out who was the king. What year was it that a certain man, Sir Van Gool, was <laughs> uh, Oh, that's a myth. Oh, well, that's just a myth. Oh, yeah, that's a myth. But I was in shorts and t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in front of my mom. But, were running into trenches, other trenches got <laughs> rivers were going through tents. It was amazing. But the next morning, the sun came out. We thawed people out. Built up large fires. Coffee was consumed by the gallon. Coffee and brandy was consumed by the leader. And we went out and started fighting because it was the warmest thing we could do. And it was fun. We had to fight way on the other side of the bridge in all the racks. We were just way down there. That was the first year we started talking about maybe moving it because there were so many people. Yeah. We had close to 800 people there and we were really jammed especially with two-thirds of our fighting area taken away by the water. It was also the year that we had a guy, a mundane upriver, fall off the cliffs and get thrown up on the shore on the opposite side of the river. He was in bad shape, three green sticks. And we... Uh, Took care of me as long as we could, got a lifeguard in, and he was helicoptered out. And he lived. And once again, the FCA got a commendation. It was nice to have. Yeah. Borough 4, it's not clear, but it could have been on the Ottawa Was on the they were, they were on the throne December preceding that. Yeah, it was him. Ottawa and Mr. Carenza. Are natives of the Darien Basin Phoenix. Lovely couple. One of the prettiest queens we've ever had. And her daughter looks just like her. <laughs> so, was that the year that Alberon took on the non world to take their butt? Yes, it was. I just wanted to make sure that was brought up. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't only Alberon. Great River was there too. We swapped out. And we had uh, Sir Taras on the bagpipes. And we had the wonderful <laughs> flying Sir Wilhelm of the Walls. Sir Wilhelm, an Albanian, got bored. So he wanted to uh, have some fun and go out in a blaze of glory. I don't recommend anybody try this. So he got with his crony, Sir Marcus Erebus, and Sir Zotmeyer. And they put down Sir Marcus's big shield, and Sir Wilhelm came running up placed his foot upon the shield and was thrown into the ranks of the West. They said we could use Clubbing all the way. <laughs> and just getting trashed. I saw four pole arms hit him at the same time. 
wasn't that the year also that we started the game, the Dwarves, with this thing called uh, Troll Toss or Zatar Toss? I don't remember. <laughs> I spent most of four drumming. <laughs> I trashed my knee. Me, yeah. So it was the year before that they declared that you couldn't throw people? Yes. I was going to pass that one up. Thank you for bringing that up. During the third Burrow Creek, I was walking. There was a nice line of the enemy over there, and there was a guy from Great River, which is Maroon. Maroon. Yeah. Just laying there dead, and I said, Is your armor good armor? He just yeah. he said, Do you mind if I throw you against their line? He goes, No, not at all. So I walked up and stuck my sticks in the ground and walked back and picked him up and walked to my sticks and threw him. Grabbed my sticks and went through the hole. Got a whole bunch of dead people. Well, <laughs> at uh, court, they said I couldn't throw people anymore. No one could throw people anymore. They didn't just single me out. But I thought that sucked. <laughs> Ian didn't. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to four. It really was getting tight. Then five came. And at five, it was determined that we had to find a new site. We had over 900 people. The site was too small for 900 people because we also had 200 RVers there who were watching us. And one RVer is three campsites. So uh, we started looking. And there was five. There were five. Uh oh, I gave you the wrong king and queen for verse four. Four would have been you. Five was in you. Yeah. And they proclaimed at the closing court that a search would be made for an additional, for a new site. I'm right. Uh, Maybe? No. It's 80. So the officers of the King of Leightonville and the Principality of the Sun started looking for a new site. And we had a volunteer who owned 200 something acres off of I 10 between Phoenix and Bose. And he proclaimed that we could use it for only a small amount of money. Uh, so we said, What the heck? And so, Great Desert War One, commonly known as Kitty Litter One, or Sandbox, or sandbox One, occurred. Uh, and the winds never stopped, and, and the, the sand never blowing stopped. never stopped, and this was the introduction of the drums, the 20, and they never stopped. Twenty minutes, twenty miles an hour. The winds never dropped below 20. But everything was going. Flags were rippling the wrong way. My squire caused an international incident. He uh, made off with the Kingdom of the West battle flag. Took it from the hand of their dead king, who he had slain and wouldn't give it back. He said it was a battle trophy and it was his. And I backed him up. You weren't there? Oh, yeah. You didn't go to Great Desert. Yeah, there's a Right on the corner. Okay. Everything was greedy. You get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you come out, smile, and you'd be full of grit. The drums started. I never stopped. Never stopped. Mm -hmm. Two and a half days. 
people walking around with shaved heads, painted faces, colors, <laughs> tattoos, paint. Really kind of interesting. Some say that the Aslans went collectively mad that day, driven so by the dust. But I don't think so. I think it was the road. Anyway, as usual, the Alpins had a good time. And Aiden got one the party. The wind made it, the wind and the grit made it a very difficult war to have a lot of fun in. Now, they had built a couple of forts. forts. Hill forts with a moat to play with. And they were kind of fun. No. But the wind killed it. Then we had Great Desert 2, which, for reasons unremembered, I could not go to. But from the stories I heard, it was no better. The wind wasn't quite as bad, but... Put it bluntly, the place sucked. Yeah. As a site for over a thousand people, it wouldn't do. Well, after the first year, we paid for the guy's well. The guy put it in a well, and then they had the well pump stolen over the winter. So we didn't get to use the well the second year. One thing I'd like to add on the first year, the drums really upset a lot of people. This was the start of the Rolling Thunder drums. It was also the start of a battle between House Rolling Thunder and House Drafen of Kai that is to this day still one of the first battles that's kind of a warm-up battle that they do out there. <coughs> After the first desert war, uh, the head of the enemy was brought to Kai In this case, it was a broken drum uh, head that was brought to them on one of our glaives, and everyone drank from their sacred horn of honor and mead, and feelings were kind of uh, mended as far as the drums and all. And, uh, of course, we know where the Rolling Thunder drums went after that. Back to Kitty Litter 2. And then... There were mundane reasons you could That marks the end of the early what you would call barbaric wars. And we come to the first Australia War. The first Australia War, there was nothing so formal as a treaty, but the principal kingdoms got together worked out a scenario, or a series of scenarios for Saturday and for Sunday, involving points, involving an open field battle, involving a bridge battle, involving resurrection battle, involving a broken field battle. We were able to get the first battle on Saturday to be a resurrection battle because after driving all that way, the earlier wars had taught us <coughs> that when our fighters hit the field first thing Saturday, they are no longer sane. They are mad with bloodlust. And it causes problems. They've got to get it out of their system. And the best way to get it out of their system is with a resurrection battle that doesn't count for anything. By the time the resurrection battle is over, they're, oh yeah, okay, they're, you can't really call them sane, but you can say that they're relaxed and ready to start listening, taking orders, and doing all the good stuff. So it, it became more of a safety issue than anything else. Have a long, protracted 
our resurrection battle before you do anything else. And you'll have less injuries, you'll have less tension, you'll have less tempers. We also had champion battles. We got rid of those too. It's foolish when you've got a thousand fighters there to make them watch 20 men fight. Why stand around in your armor just to watch 20 men fight? Chuck that, have another battle so that everybody can fight. Besides, it puts too much pressure on 20 men. You've got the whole army watching, and all the women, and all the royalty. Too much pressure. Did I really get hit? Uh, I should slough that. No. Made it too hard for them. Made them balance their honor on the edge of their sword. It's difficult for some people. So we got rid of champions. Every once in a while they stick their head back up. It's because the people who are running things don't remember what it was like earlier this year. Then we started working on drawing out scenarios and trying to make the whole weekend into one continuous scenario with different battles. You'd fight an open field battle, which is one army landing on the shores of another army, and then whichever army comes back and holds the bridge against the invading army, and then they catch them in the open fields, and then they leave. One leads to another, naturally. You don't fight this one and then take a break. You fight this one and the dead go over here and reform. And when this one's over, you get five minutes for water or ten minutes for water, which usually turns into 20 minutes because the marshals have to talk and the kings have to assert their kingship and all that stuff. And then you fight 30 minutes later. But it was shorter than before. And it goes on and on. Over the years, Burrow Creek was the stimulus for an awful lot of good ideas that reached fruition <coughs> in a in a straight award. The negotiations, trying to make a continuous battlefield. Managing to get them to agree to fight on Friday. That took 18 years of constantly pounding on the table and saying, you've got 800 fighters there by Friday and all they're doing is getting drunk. They need to have something to do. They need to have fun. They didn't come to fight tournaments. It's stupid to have a tournament with 200 people in it. It takes all day. So many. They wouldn't even put melee tournaments together. So, getting them to fight a portion of the war on Friday was a big step forward. Getting them to assign, well, not even assign, but acknowledge that certain kingdoms are going to have a party on certain nights and to leave it to hell alone because it's going to happen. That was a nice thing to have finally come through. What year was it that we became so politically correct that we thought we should include arts and science competitions in the uh, I wish I knew. Thing? Who was I responsible for that one? I think it was... They might say it here. No. It doesn't? Nine years ago. Nine, ten years, yeah. Nine, 
I'm pretty sure it was nine years ago. I fought it as long as I could. But eventually you have to realize that, hey, the same arguments that went for the fighters coming to war and needing to fight went for everybody else who came to the war and wanted to show off what they did. So it was only logical and it was only fair and it was only chivalrous to allow the people to do what they wanted to do. So you bring the arts in, you bring the crafts in, you bring everything in that everyone wants to do and make it an Affair. event that appeals to everyone. Do you believe that? I had to say that. Like I believed it. I don't. <laughs> I have come to understand that point of view. Overall, it's probably the correct thing to do. Because the more people that are having a good time, the less people are getting in the way. Idle hands screw up the world. Whose idea was it to have points of the war at all? Theirs. Wasn't that Ivan's? No. Wasn't an Ivan thing? Oh, by the way, before I forget, mm -hmm. after Great Desert War One, Kitty Little One, when my squire absconded with the war banner of the West, the West was wounded to the heart and withdrew from the Great Desert War. Now, the war banner of the West was a rag that they had painted something on. My lady made them a war banner that was more fitting to be shown on Aiden's lands. And we sent that to them, to their midwinter court, and had it presented to their crown in recompense for the one I aspired to. But since that time, the King of the West has refused to bring his army to the Strait. They do hold a grudge. However, Western fighters are free to go to Australia as mercenaries. So they do.